So I you're think, saying 100 billion is too much, but right now we have too little. I don't know that 100 billion is too much if it was well spent. Mm -hmm. I think that most people don't have a good conceptual framework for how to spend $100 billion. <laughs> I, I, I do. So if you give me $100 billion, <laughs> I, mean, I, I could spend it very well. But I've, I've probably spent more time thinking about how to spend $100 billion than, than most AI researchers. I think the feeling of the AI researchers responding to the survey was that if, you know, a billion or $100 billion was put into AI research, it would become some huge, wasteful government boondoggle where all the money was siphoned off into large, meaningless projects, which certainly happens occasionally with, or more than occasionally, with large government expenditures. Say, it could turn out like the Japanese fifth-generation AI project, where a lot of money was put into one specific approach, declarative logic AI in prologue, and it, and it didn't pan out. And I think the the feeling of the respondents to that survey was there's a bunch of AGI projects that could make use of millions up to tens of millions of dollars each. Yeah. And the best approach would be to throw that amount of money at each of these projects and see where it goes. But, you know, there may be no more than a few dozen such projects that are really mature right now. Say a few dozen projects on the planet working toward AGI that are mature enough to make good use of, say, 20 to $50 million. Mm -hmm. So if you had 20 projects, each of which could make good use of $20 million, I mean, that's a lot more money than I have in my bank account <laughs> by, by orders of magnitude, but it's still not $100 billion. So I think that was what is underlying the yeah. response to the survey. But I... I do think it's, it's quite absurd in a sort of world historical sense that not just my own project, but the other couple dozen AGI projects are not funded to the tune of a, a few million dollars a year. When, when, you look at, when you look at what is at stake, right? Mm -hmm, I mean, if, if you had 20 AGI projects, 5 million a year, you're talking $100 million a year. Yeah to work on creating superhuman thinking machines at a time in history yeah. when it really is quite palpable awesome. to do so. Yeah. And, it's, I mean, you know, we spent a trillion bucks bailing out banks and <laughs> the U.S. government alone in the last couple of years alone, probably another trillion dollars that the Federal Reserve spent surreptitiously bailing out banks without publicly announcing it. Trillions of dollars, right? We're talking a hundred million dollars to fund twenty AGI projects at, at a fairly satisfying level, and our society simply is not organized to do such a thing. And well, that's me... uh, that's that's something that this is something that our AGI descendants are going to look back on and think is is quite ridiculous. <laughs> I agree entirely with you, but my next two questions are still on this topic with a couple of new dimensions, I hope. One of them is uh, the origin of funding. Um, I was listening to a, to a speech by David Chalmers uh, that he gave in uh, West Point Military Academy, and uh, one of the reasons why cadets from the academy concluded that it's best if they proceed with this development of uh, uh, military artificial intelligence uh, rather than abandon it despite the risks uh, was that you see if if it's not an American singularity it's going to be most likely a Chinese singularity so uh, the, the American singularity we have control over but a Chinese one we don't therefore we'd rather move on despite the risks so you you have you work uh, in China, you have a position, a professorship position there. Do you think that the Chinese are taking a different approach in terms of funding AGI research than, uh, say, most people in North America and in Europe? And do you think that uh, they have a, a lower, equal, or better chance of, of coming up with, with a Chinese AGI rather than anyone else? 
I have spent a lot of time in China in the last couple of years working on AI. So I'm I'm an adjunct professor in an AI lab at Xiamen University in China, and I also am involved with Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And this is a kind of exciting announcement. Like just this month, we're starting a two-year project at Hong Kong Polytechnic, mm-hmm. where we'll have six programmers working on making an open cog based intelligent game character. So using my AI system, which is oriented toward working toward human level AI, using that to make a smart game character. And we'll have four AI guys and two game programming guys working on that. So uh, I expect to be spending a considerable portion of 2011 in China and or Hong Kong. Yeah. I think that the whole AI R&D scene in China is much less mature than in the U.S., mm-hmm. and that is both a plus and a minus. So the U.S. has a lot of AI achievements, more than anywhere in the world, yeah. and we also have a very entrenched infrastructure, both in academia and in industry. So, you know, DARPA, the U.S.'s uh, military research funding agency, has funded a lot of AI research. But they tend to have funded the same teams of people, the same lineages of researchers, and the same sets of ideas over and over and over again for decades. And Google is an AI company. And Microsoft has awesome AI research teams. But what these guys put their money into, again, is fairly stereotyped. I mean, they're the world's best in computational linguistics, scalable probabilistic reasoning, Bayesian nets across thousands of machines. So we do certain things very, very well, and we put a lot of money into these things, rule-based expert systems, Bayesian nets, computational linguistics, supervised machine learning. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we kick the world's ass at this stuff. On the other hand, more radical AGI research or more radical narrow AI research that doesn't fit the mold of what the U.S. AI establishment likes has a lot of trouble getting funding or getting attention. China doesn't have an entrenched AI establishment. And this is both a plus and a minus. It means there's a lot of Me Too AI research there where Chinese AI researchers, you know, they want to publish papers in Western journals because that's what they get rewarded for. And so they just take stuff that Western researchers did and kind of vary on it, improve it, copy it a bit. and. Mm-hmm. It's high quality because these are smart people, but it isn't that revolutionary. On the other hand, there's also a willingness in China just to throw resources at anything that seems cool and interesting because they don't have a fixed idea of what's going to work mm-hmm. and because they know they're behind, so they just got to try a lot of random stuff and see what works and hope some wild thing will will let them leap ahead. And I think that's... Part of what I see is the reason why we got funding for OpenCog in Hong Kong from the Hong Kong government Mm -hmm. and in in China from the Chinese National Science Foundation. It's not so much that they had a profound insight that, yes, Ben's ideas are brilliant. It's more that they were willing to try something new, different, and and cool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's research. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't work. And this is something I think is important because... In AI, and also in in biology, in stem cell research, longevity science, China is more willing to take risks than America is. And I think that's a key point. It's it's not so much that their economy has some benefits over ours, because our economy has many benefits over theirs. It's not so much that they have more people, because, you know, 60% of their population is, is still quite poor and... Although they're literate, they don't have the mindset for high technology development. Mm -hmm. I think that the main thing they have going for them is they're willing to take risks. And we've become complacent, conservative, and and set in our ways. And that's that's a problem. We, we We bring in the smartest people from around the world who want to come to the U.S. and and make a name for themselves. But once they get here, they then get slotted into the same entrenched 
things that everyone does here. So, I mean, a, a smart AI guy comes here from China or India, and, you know, they'll get a job at Google, and they'll do statistical linguistics. But if, if they stay in India or China, you know, maybe they'll do nonsense because they're cut off from the main streams of advancement, or maybe they'll do some wacky off-the-wall thing that no one would ever get paid to do in, in the U.S., but in China they're more open-minded. And it's, it's a source of great irony to me that a fairly totalitarian government, which is making efforts to, to open up tentatively, and I, I think that's laudable, but still a government that doesn't focus on freedom yeah. as much as ours does, in effect, gives its researchers much more freedom than we do. Because, I mean, they, of course, in the U.S., you have the freedom to research whatever you want. No one will lock you up. But, but if you don't have well, the funding. But you won't get paid. Yeah. Right. You won't get tenure if you're a young researcher. Whereas in, in China, it's easier to make it as a university researcher doing weird stuff than it is in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that, that should disturb people, but... It doesn't because people tend to focus on, on the wrong things when they think about China. Now, Peter Thiel got it partly right. P Peter Thiel, who's a, the head of, of Clarium Capital, one of the, the early funders of Facebook. You could see him in, in the, the recent Social Network movie. There's an actor portraying him. And he uh, was the leader of PayPal for a while. I, I don't agree with, with Peter on everything. We have a lot of differences both in political philosophy, I mean, he's kind of a hardcore libertarian, whereas where, where I'm not. And he's more skeptical of AGI being achieved in the near term than I am. Mm -hmm. But I think he, he got some things right about China. He, he said the following in, in a speech I heard him give. He said, China gets a lot of things wrong compared to the U.S., but they get one important thing right. And it's such an important thing that they may make up for all their mistakes. What they get right is they're willing to think for the long term. They're willing to plan for the next 30 years. And the U.S. plans for the next quarter. And you can see that in research funding. The U.S. funds what they think will be successful in the next couple of years. China will try a bunch of random stuff and see what's going to work over the next few decades. Because if they try 100 weird things, five of them may work awesomely. Then they'll be ahead of the U.S., 10 or 20 years from now. And this is something I see in, in Silicon Valley. Because, you know, I live in Maryland, in, near Washington, D.C., but I, I visit Silicon Valley a lot. And everyone asks, well, you know, you, you look like you belong in California. And there, there's people doing, people doing so much cool AI stuff in California. You know, wh why aren't you there? And... You know, honestly, I might be, if not for various personal reasons. I, I share custody of my kids with my ex-wife who lives in Maryland. But I have mixed feelings toward the whole attitude and, and vibe of the, of the San Francisco Bay Area. I mean, it's amazing how many futurists there are, how many AI people, how many brilliant technologists there are. On the other hand, anytime you have a group of people who think they're smarter than everyone else and who are all kind of thinking the same way. You got to be a little bit skeptical that these, these guys are... You're concerned about groupthink. 